Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Australian National University Webinar Week. My name is Akhil Feroz, and I work at the ANU College of Engineering and Computer Science International Student Recruitment and Partnerships team. A big thank you to all the attendees and participating panel members today. We hope you find the session useful and look forward to having an engaging discussion with you. If there's one word that encapsulates students and the staff at the ANU, my word for that would be resilience. Um, from bushfires and hailstorms at the beginning of this year to the COVID-19 pandemic, it's been a challenging year for everyone, and it's only June. In today's webinar, Supporting Students with Remote Learning, we will talk about our community's resilience in adapting to the new normal through discussions with our panel members and how their efforts have helped our students transition from in-person classes to remote learning. The session will also cover topics on how classes are run, how labs and workshops are organized and how students are being assessed on their performance. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce today our panelists. We have with us Dr. Uwe Zimmer, the Associate Director of Education at the Research School of Computer Science. We have Dr. Tosh Miltop, Lecturer and Research Fellow at the ANU College of Engineering and Computer Science, and Dr. Liang Zheng, Lecturer, Arc Dekra Fellow, and CS Futures Fellow at the Research School of Computer Science at ANU. Thank you for your time and support in organizing this useful session for our incoming students. And before I hand over to Josh, I would also like to request all of you to mute your microphones if you have not done so already. If you have any questions, please feel free to add your question in the Q&A chat window below. Maggie from the marketing team and I will be coordinating these sessions with, the, with the, these questions with the panelists. Um, over, over to you now, Josh. Thank you, Akhil. And thank you everyone who's tuned in today. Um, it's, it's really nice for me to be able to talk to you as uh, for many of you, if you are um, enrolling in a Master of Computing or um, a, maybe a similar course, my course, Comp 6710 Structured Programming, may be one of the first courses that you study in your first semester. Um, so I wanted to quickly take you through a little bit about my course, but more generally about how we, how, how we do online teaching in my course, um, just so you get an idea of what you'll actually be doing as a student at the ANU. Um, now, I can't speak for all of the computing courses, but uh, the approaches may be similar in other courses, I hope. Um, and so we have Liang and, and Uwe who are teaching other courses, and they'll tell you which, some information about their courses, which may be a little different. Um, so I'm going to share my screen with you, um, and so I can show you uh, some information about Comp 6710 Structured Programming, the course that I teach. Okay, so this is the, the course website, um, and all of the material for the course is online. Um, of course, since, the, since COVID-19 and uh, the disruptions that have happened due to COVID-19, um, we've had to move to completely online teaching. That wasn't too hard for us as a lot of the information, the course materials and so on was online already. Um, we just had to move to lectures and lab classes being conducted entirely online as well. So in my course, uh, you will learn various uh, fundamental programming concepts and use them to build substantial programs. The course is focused on imperative object oriented style programming. And so we use the Java programming language um, because that's the most widely used language in the industry and it has excellent tooling and resources available for it. So as well as basic programming, we touch on some fundamental concepts in computer science. We teach abstract data types and practice their implementation using a variety of fundamental data structures. Uh, we start to look at algorithmic analysis and complexity and we think about the differences between syntax and semantics and between language definitions and implementations in programming languages. And finally, we introduce basic software engineering tools and techniques. So we think about things like integrated development environments, version control, uh, skeleton design, unit testing, technical documentation and code review. And we use these techniques throughout the course to work in a group to build a substantial Java application. And that's typically a computer version of a board game. Okay, so that's sort of the high level overview of what you do in the course, but what do you do each week in the course? Okay, well, so um, as I said, all the materials for the course are online. Um, in the lectures, uh, the lectures are divided into different topics. Um, so there are short topics 
And for each of these, um, the lectures are divided into two main halves. So the first thing is uh, a sort of a, a recorded um, overview of the high level concepts for a unit. And then we'll break into a live coding exercise. And I'll show you a quick example of the sort of thing that we do there. I hope everyone can, can see this. Please yell out if you can't see this. Um, okay, so in a live coding exercise, this is me giving, I might just mute this. So I'm working on a, here I'm working on a complex coding problem and the students are working with me, um, making suggestions about different ways of solving the problem, um, asking questions and guiding the direction in which I'm going. So together we're collaboratively solving the problem. And um, the students Josh. have bugs. Oh, can you see this? No, sorry to jump in. We can't see a screen. Oh, okay, great, yeah. thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hang on. I'm gonna reshare and hopefully I'll get it right this time. Thank you. Okay. Okay, can you see can you see this now? You should be able to see a uh, Yes. Okay, fantastic. Okay, let me run that again. So this is an example of one of the live coding exercises that I run in class. Um, and in this example, um, I'm working through a complex coding problem. The students are giving me suggestions as I go. Um, they're finding the bugs in what I'm writing and they're um, they're basically guiding my direction as I'm creating the code. So sometimes the students make suggestions that I hadn't expected and I'll be coding for quite a long time, not really knowing where it's going to end up, um, which is quite exhausting for me and a little bit scary, but it's, it's good fun to work together. And, you know, together we can explore the ideas and we learn much more than if it were just me demonstrating um, in silence or if it were just students working by themselves. So I really enjoy this way of working. Okay, so that's sort of that's the lectures. That's roughly how they work. Um, by the way, feel free to sort of jump in with questions in the chat, and I'll try and uh, watch the chat as I'm going. Okay, there's a lot to make to keep track of, but I, I can see your text, your questions in the text chat if you want to ask them. Okay, so that's the lectures. Um, as well, for every unit, there are homework acti activities associated with each of the units. And these are all uh, coding exercises in which we provide you with a specification and you work to implement that specification in code. And along with that, we provide you tests to help you check whether you've implemented that specification correctly. It helps you practice programming and apply those key ideas. So as well as the lectures and the homework, um, you'll join a small group session, a lab session that runs every week. And the lab is hosted by a skilled tutor. That's usually a student who just studied the course in a previous semester, maybe the very previous or maybe just a, a year or two ago, and they really mastered the material. And so in your lab, you'll work on uh, set activities um, and you receive one-to-one -one feedback from your tutor on um, how to work through those activities and also on other course material that you may have submitted. Um, and so I'll just show you another quick demonstration. This is a, another video. I hope you can, you can, um, what's happened here? Okay. So this is a demonstration video um, cre created of one of the lab sessions by one of our tutors, Peter. And so, as you can see, Peter is, is taking the students through a particularly complex search problem, um, working through some of the ways to design a solution to this problem, and then uh, we'll take the students through, again, a sort of a live coding exercise where they solve the problem together. Uh, and so, in your lab group, you're working with, uh, you know, around 12 students in a small group, and you'll get to know those students very well because you'll be in the same group with them every, every week. Uh, and some of them you'll be working together on the group assignment, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Okay, so that's um, that's our lab sessions. Now, in terms of assessment, I'll just turn that off. In terms of assessment in the course, 
um, you probably all want to know how the course is assessed. Um, so, of course, we have exams in the course. Um, the lab tests and the exams are focused on programming tasks. Um, this is a very programming focused course. For the coding questions, again, just like homework, we provide a program specification and we ask you to implement it, implement it correctly. And we provide you with tests to let you check whether or not you've correctly implemented that specification. For the assignment tasks, the first assignment is an individual programming task um, that just helps you practice imperative and object-oriented programming to complete the implementation of uh, a puzzle or a game. Um, so this semester, for example, we had a little board game um, where you move these, it's a puzzle, you move these boats around and try and um, make them uh, reach their goals by, by turning these uh, discs on a game. So we implemented this as a computer game. Um, and, you know, there were various tasks around implementing solving of this puzzle. So that's an individual task and it uh, just helps you practice the basic programming skills. For the second assignment, this is the really the centerpiece of the course. It's a major group assignment that you complete with other students uh, in weeks four to 12 of the course. And it's a large, complex programming task that requires you work together as a team to create an overall design, define interfaces, divide up the work, and integrate your code together as a complete working game with a graphical interface. And so along the way, um, as you can imagine, working with a group on a big task like this, you practice those software engineering skills like version control and testing, and continuous integration and code review and other software engineering techniques. And so this semester, uh, the game was a, was a board game called Metro, um, and I'll show you a, a quick demonstration. Um, I hope I can find this um, of the Metro game. Okay, so here we have uh, four different presentations of the Metro game. So at the end of each, at the end of the semester, each group presents their game like this um, to their group mates, uh, to, to the, their um, fellow students in the lab classes, and they receive feedback from their fellow students and also, of course, from the tutor. And in fact, every week from weeks four to 12, as you're working on this game, uh, your tutor is gonna provide you feedback on what you've developed so far and give you suggestions on how to improve it. So it's, it's really a, a task that builds from week to week. Um, so I hope uh, you can see the kind of the complexity of some of the games that were developed there. Um, they were really quite impressive, um, some of the efforts that the students made this semester. Okay, um, apologies, I'll just bring that back. Okay, so um, that's kind of almost everything I wanted to say. The only other thing I wanted to mention was that our class has a really active online forum. This is something we really encourage. Um, not just asking questions in lectures and in labs, but also any time of day when, when a question comes to mind, uh, you can go onto the online forum and ask a question about um, whatever task you're working on. And if you feel really confident, you can answer those questions for other students as well. Um, so some students uh, really enjoy helping others and as you get more confident, I'm sure you'll enjoy it too. Your lecturer and your tutors will be on the forum regularly answering questions. So you can usually get an answer within a few minutes of asking a question, which is great. And um, that's if you ask a good question. And if you don't feel confident about asking good questions, that's okay. We teach you how to ask good technical questions as well in a way that will increase your chances of getting a good answer. And we also, throughout the week, we have regular one-to-one -one consultation sessions in which you can ask a tutor questions about any aspect of the course material. Okay, so that's sort of all of the basic information that I wanted to give you about um, how our courses run online. Um, I did hope, I, I hoped that I would have um, two of my tutors here as well. And I might just quickly talk with Akhil and see if we can allow them to talk as well. But um, for now, are there any questions that anyone has about the operation of the course? Akhil, are you filtering questions? Yeah, there's nothing, nothing specific yet. Um, yeah. 
did you want me to grant access to one of your tutors? Ah, yes. So I can see I, I can see my tutors are here. So we also have uh, Yu Ching Zai uh, and Vikram Sondergaard, who are two of the tutors um, for this semester. And so they may be able to tell you a little bit more about the course and about um, studying uh, at the School of Computer Science um, from the point of view of students. So um, maybe Yu Ching, if we start with you, you're you're actually a master's student. All oh, right. Thank you, Josh. Uh, so, hello, everyone. I'm Yichun Jai, and I'm currently a second year student in Master of Computing. And I took this course in my first semester. I find it very interesting. And uh, actually, studying in NU is quite different from my previous study experience. So, like here, we, especially this semester, we move to the online mode. So, like, we have to figure out so many questions based on ourselves and we can ask for some help from the teachers. Um, in this course, I feel like um, it's well supported by all the other teachers and we have quite organized and detailed um, documentations about how you can do uh, each task and something like that. So if you feel there is any um, questions you have or there is any difficulties you have, you can just feel free to ask on Piazza, which is an online forum that uh, George just wrote. So um, that's all from my perspective. So would you like to speak more about that? Background? Thanks, Yu Ching. Yes, this semester, uh, particularly our tutors have had to be very flexible because um, we've changed the way we teach a little bit. and. This has actually been, from my point of view, one of the real strengths of ANU is the, the quality of the tutors that we have here. Um, my tutors have been, have been uh, very flexible and, and quick thinking in how they've adjusted, and testing things out, um, finding out what works and quickly changing the way they teach. So uh, thank you, Yuching, and thank you, Vikram. Vikram, did you have anything to add? Yeah, hey guys. Um, I'm, my name is Vikram. I'm an undergraduate computer science student at the ANU, so I have just done half of my third year here. Um, yeah, I think Yu Ching put most of it really, like put it all really well. Um, I guess I've, I haven't had a previous university experience. ANU has been my only university experience, but um, structured programming, so Comp 16, 6, 7, 10, um, it's definitely been my favorite course. Uh, and there's some very good courses at computer science. So um, that's really saying something, but I always find that a lot of the courses at ANU are very well organized. Um, and I think you can hear it from when Josh mentions about how to ask good technical questions and all of these things that when I come into a computer science degree, I don't think of those things initially, but now that I'm in it, now that I've been in it for a while, I realize those things are also just as important. So this is a really well-rounded education that you guys are looking at. So yeah, thanks Josh. Thanks Rico. Um, so Akil, I said I said an awful lot. Um, <laughs> maybe maybe the students are um, you know not ready to ask questions at this point. So maybe we can pass on to uh, either Uva or Yang. Yeah, sure. Um, where would you like to go next? Um, maybe Ooh, I can uh, do yeah. Yeah, I can do yeah. next. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks, Liang. Uh, yeah. Sure. Uh, let me share my screen. And while Liang shares his screen, just a reminder that you can always. Pop in your questions in the Q&A box. Thanks, Liam. Okay, um, sure. Um, let me open it. Okay, so, uh, Akio, you can't see my screen, right? Okay, cool. So, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Liang. I will be the convener and lecturer of uh, COMP 3670 and 670 introduction to machine learning. Um, so, <clears throat> so I'm gonna, be, uh, I'm gonna give you a bit um, idea of what machine learning is. So machine learning is a quite hot topic nowadays. So uh, it is quite different from pure programming. So in programming, you input some data and a program into a computer and the computer will give you an output by executing on your program and your data. For example, the program could be a calculator. 
So uh, different from traditional programming, um, the input of a machine learning system is the data and the task. So the computer, uh, the, the task could be like some, something like image classification, uh, image detection. Then um, using some device training method, the computer will learn from the data and um, the task and output a model. So this model will be used in the testing phase. So this is a difference between machine learning and traditional programming. So um, here are some applications of machine learning. This is an example of face detection where uh, faces of very various scales, occlusions, viewpoints, and illuminations are detected. Uh, another example of machine learning would be that is called the generative adversarial network. You input a real life picture to the model in the left column. The model then will render this picture into the style of some famous artists, for example, Monet. In this example, you could see for each row that the image content from left to, to right has not been changed. What is changed is the image style. So from the real world style into the style of some artists. So this is another application of machine learning. So um, this is a brief idea of what machine learning is like. So, the, so those are some high level applications of machine learning. And in my course, what I will teach is some fundamental and mathematics concepts of machine learning because some strong mathematics background is required. My course will teach um, some useful and important mathematics besides machine learning. So basically these mathematics would cover something like vector calculus, probability distribution, and matrix decomposition. Uh, for the machine learning part, I will teach clustering, linear regression, Gaussian mixture model, and etc. So I will mainly use Python in my course. So the mathematics part will take around five weeks and machine learning part will take six weeks. Uh, and in the last week, there will be guest lectures and a course review. Um, my course has um, three to four assignments, both having, a, every assignment will have both theory and programming. So uh, my course also has two exams. So uh, the mid semester exam and final exam both takes around 30% of the uh, total marks. So previously, last, uh, last year, we had some hurdle exams. Uh, maybe next semester, I will consider to remove those hurdles in, in order to adapt to the new normal. Um, for labs and tutorials, our tutors for next semester will be those students who received very good grades from last year and also some excellent tutors from last year. Um, so our labs and tutorial will have one-on-one -on -one instructions and we will focus both on programming and theory, but theory is our major focus. And we will also host some online drop-in Q&A sessions for uh, students who work from home or who are overseas. Okay. Um, So I think a feature of my course is not only teaches, we not only teach the concepts and mathematics in machine learning, uh, but also I will uh, introduce some latest progress in the academia related to the lectures. So um, actually um, uh, myself through the teaching of last, last year, I was able to develop a very interesting research idea. Um, so I will definitely introduce, introduce this research in my next semester's teaching. The idea is about uh, the most fundamental concepts in machine learning, which is the 
performance estimation, which I highlighted in red, in red. So you, you, you estimate your model performance every time you have a model. So you can observe from this figure that the performance evaluation is one of the pillars in a machine learning pipeline. So for example, in performance evaluation, uh, in traditional machine learning, when you do, for example, image classification, you feed an image into a classifier and the classifier will tell you that um, this image belongs to the category of cat. Then we check the ground truth of this image, which says it is a cat. So this is a correct prediction. So similarly, a classifier may tell us that this image is actually a dog, but the ground truth says it is a cat. So in this case, we have a wrong prediction. So this is what we will learn in the class. So it's very fundamental. You, you compare your prediction with the ground truth, and if they, are, if they are the same, then it's a correct prediction. Otherwise, it is wrong prediction. It's very fundamental. So the problem is, the problem is, this is our traditional machine learning. So the problem is, what if we don't have the ground truth? So we only have the prediction result of the model. We only have the prediction, but we don't have the ground truth. So can we still evaluate the model accuracy without ground truth? So this is a very fundamental but interesting problem, evaluating your model without knowing the ground truth, but only the prediction. Okay, so, um, so, so those are the things that we will teach in the class. So, but the research problem is very new and important. Actually, we face this type of problems many times in the real world, but there are actually no studies into the problem. So, for example, uh, we, I just mentioned we have a, a cat and dog classifier. So if we deploy our cat dog classifier into a swimming pool environment like, like this, we don't have the ground truth of which is a cat and which is a dog. So we can't tell exactly how good the classifier is. So we don't have the ground truth. We only have the images. We don't, have, we don't know which image is a dog and which image is a cat. So uh, what I developed, the idea I developed is named the auto-evaluation, just the title shows auto-evaluation, where you can evaluate the correctness of your model without accessing the ground truth labels. So we don't have the ground truth labels, but you can still have an estimation of how, how well your model performs. So this is the idea that I develop, myself developed from my last year's teaching. So, um, so yeah, this is, um, I think it could, could be a feature of my course that I will cover um, a decent percent of my time to develop, uh, to introducing the latest development in the machine learning area. Okay. Uh, also, I want to um, um, point out that there are, um, there are many research opportunities at ANU. So uh, I often tell my students that only, only taking courses, that's, that does not mean you master everything in machine learning, uh, particularly in the machine learning area where the state, of the, the state of the art is evolving so quickly, you need to stand at the front line of a certain area in order to get a deep understanding of it. So, um, the unique, strong envi research environment at ANU uh, could give students a unique opportunities. Um, we have many renowned academics and also strong research students. Um, many coursework students also have research projects as part of their degree. I usually encounter student, uh, in encourage students to identify some interesting research problems and seek a suitable academic to work with. And I'm very happy to see that quite a few students have made good progress in research. So I will show you several examples, um, not just um, in the next slide. So for example, 
the first students I, um, I supervised, I, I am now supervising was a Bachelor of Advanced Computing undergrad students. Um, his research is in visual navigation. He did his uh, honors project with me and also, uh, and now he is a master, a master of philosophy student now working with me. So uh, he started this year from uh, February or January this year and has submitted two papers to ECCV and OPS. So um, um, the second student is now an MLCV master student and his research is in reinforcement learning and has submitted two papers to NOPES this year. So apparently, apparently uh, both students were impacted by COVID-19 because we all work from home, but they are still able to make the achievements by effective remote working. So, um, so these are some examples that I know. I'm pretty sure there are more students in our school who have made good research progress. So although both the academics, both supervisors and students are working from home, uh, apparently I think there is some good chemistry that is happening between uh, supervisors and students and uh, to make sure that students could have some good research progress in, under these difficult times. Um, okay, so um, that's all for my um, talk. So if you have any questions, let me know. Maybe I'm still, I could still answer one or two questions. Sure. Um, Liang, so we have a, um, a question from Yufan and thank you for the great session. Um, the student wants to know how they can access research opportunities in general. And I guess this could also be a segue into one of the other questions we get um, around coursework students accessing research opportunities as well. So if you could answer that. Thanks, Akil. Um, yeah, no and thanks for the question. Um, um, so actually, um, um, actually, our school has collected a joint response from supervisors who could offer some uh, research projects to honor students or individual uh, research projects. So I think this information could be viewed on the um, RSCS website, I think so. And also, um, so those are some public information where supervisors present some, you know, research project opportunities publicly and students could contact supervisors with, uh, if you're interested in certain projects, you can contact the corresponding supervisor from there. Uh, so the other way to contact supervisors is to, um, for example, if you could find some interesting problems while you are studying certain courses, then you can contact your lecturer or convener to discuss with them whether you can do your, super, uh, your research with them. Uh, this is actually the way that I identif identified my second student. Um, the second student actually is a student of my course and um, he discussed me a lot uh, after class. So um, regarding his research interest and we were able to find a certain area that he could work in. So, um, which turns out very uh, good for him and he was very effective after that. So this is another way, so you can speak with your lecturer, lecturer during, during class or after class. And this is another way of do, uh, finding a supervisor. The third way I think is, um, for example, through honors project. Um, so many students um, should take an honor, honors project as part of their degree. So, um, so the students um, typically will look for a supervisor uh, that you are working on one of his projects. So, um, so if you do your honors project very well, then you have a very pretty good opportunity to continue to do your research either as a PhD student or as a master of philosophy student to further uh, work on your research. I think those are the th three, I think three ways that you can have some opportunities. Yeah. 
Thanks for the question. All right, Lian, thank you for that. Uh, we might just hand over to Uwe um, to talk about his part before we actually take on all the questions. Any thoughts on that, Uwe? Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, perfect. Okay, people, um, welcome again. I can answer a bit wider questions as well. Um, as I'm um, also uh, signing responsible for the rest of the programs and uh, all the computer science activities. And I would like to focus actually on your questions, which are probably most concerned. Should I actually come to the ANU? Should I actually start this semester at the ANU at all? Or is the ANU just joining yet another online operation like all the other guys are doing? And what's the difference actually for going for any other university or going to the ANU? So. What are we offering at the ANU? Um, by the way, on the side, I don't have, I would not like to torture you through slides. I would just send you a link to the course website, which I'm signing responsible for for next semester. And you can look through that um, while I'm talking you through this course as well. But before I come to that course itself, I would like to actually step back a little bit and uh, try to, ex to give you some information why you can come to the ANU, why does it make any sense? Now, as you guessed, we are little proud people here. We have high standards and I uh, would like to pride ourselves that we take care of our students and we have lots of interaction with the students. We are not just posting some jobs to do and you go some hacking in uh, as a homework and then you come back and submit your stuff. We are actually uh, looking after you in a one-to-one -one, uh, way as well. So as Josh and Yang already introduced, um, all the live sessions will be as interactive as you possibly can do it. So the live sessions, uh, for instance, in my course, are similar to what Josh uh, is doing. All the live sessions will be broadcast actually on multiple streams and multiple um, outlets. You can watch this on YouTube on whatever you want. And at the same time, we have highly uh, interactive forums um, at the same time. These interactive forums uh, enable you to vote for questions, to push questions further, uh, have them answered earlier. Um, we have um, live polls in the whole thing, little quizzes all the time um, to make it actually engaging. I do acknowledge this is a challenge because uh, we are all used to sit in front of um, a room with 300 people in it, and we are good with that. We can do that. But sitting in front of a screen, talking to a camera is something that we all begin to get used to, and we are not that trained with that. But we have experience now for one semester, most of us, um, how to engage with students. Now, on top of the interactive sessions, which we do, um, which is usually some uh, three, four hours uh, per week where you will see uh, the three of us here dancing around in a specific course and interacting, usually combined with the tutor or multiple tutors to support the whole operation in the process. Um, in systems networks and concurrency, the course which I'm running next semester, you also have three hours of labs per week. In those three hours, we will make sure that you have personal contact with tutors which are helping you specifically and personally. So this is all a lot more than what you would expect from, uh, I'm just taking an online course somewhat, and uh, we try to transfer the experience of uh, having a course physically from the online world into, uh, from, from the physical world into the online world as much as we can. How do we select our tutors? Uh, it helps if the tutor has some idea what he's doing, but we are not just selecting the best uh, students to do that. We are selecting the students who are most concerned about you. We are selecting the students who have a proven record of uh, listening to you and uh, working with you in a one-to-one -one basis. This is often more important than knowing the stuff. We have lots of people who know their stuff, but not all of them are lending themselves perfectly to be the best tutor. Um, I'm in a quite lucky position because um, the 2310 course, which we are running has an experienced tutor team, which will also be available again next semester, uh, who um, knows the stuff like the back of their hand. That's just a given, but they also are very well trained in uh, supporting you on all levels uh, possible. 
Please bombard questions at the same time, by the way. I'm actually looking at the uh, Q&As and the chat windows at the same time, okay? So, a little bit more, um, another differentiator coming to the ANU as opposed to coming to other universities. Um, in the Australian context and also in the international context, we are not focusing really on uh, skills. We are not actually giving you, you are the best Java programmer, you are the best C++ programmer. If you're interested in that, honestly, go somewhere else. That's not what we are focusing on. You are much more broad-minded. When you graduate from the ANU, you will be able to apply the concepts which you have here to any programming language you want. That's not a technical skill. We're not teaching you syntax. We are teaching you the overall understanding of uh, the material. And according to what industry tells us, because ultimately many of you want to have a job in the end, um, they want the ANU students specifically for that reason. They want the ANU students because they have a much broader mindset. They are not using their Swiss army knife, which they have learned at university, which could be, I don't know, C sharp or Java or whatever, and use it for everything. We have enough people of that sort. What the industry actually often wants is people who can look beyond that and um, can create new tools, can actually form the future, not just taking the existing technology um, and applying it over and over and over again, okay? So <laughs> there's certainly a differentiator. I saw a question um, on the forum as um, I only have programming background in blah. Can I still go to, for the ANU and do that? Of course, we will help you going into that. What we expect from you though is an open mind. We expect from you an open mind to be guided and not compare everything what you do. Well, as a 12 year old, I programmed in Python somewhere. So how does that look in Python? That's not the approach. No? You want to uh, look at that from a more conceptual point of view and allow yourself to be guided by our experienced uh, staff and tutors. So as I don't see uh, specific questions for this course at the moment. Um, maybe a few more words what we are doing here. Uh, concurrent systems in all variations and shapes will be completely different from what many of you have experienced so far uh, in your career. Is that exotic? It's very far from it. It will become the absolute standard because nowadays you can barely buy a pocket torch which has, doesn't have a multi-core processor environment and multi-core um, CPUs and network CPUs are becoming the complete standard everywhere. If you can handle that, if you say, well, I'm a sequential programmer, you will be out of a job in a few years. Um, so concurrent programming for that reason alone is already very interesting and relevant. It's also interesting because it will give you a very different perspective on uh, programming and designing uh, solutions. If you come from a more physical environment, if you, I don't know, play music, um, if you come from sports of any of that sort, concurrent operations will come completely natural to you because you know that things in nature usually, and also in art and other areas, are usually not sequential. So the artifact that computer science is often introduced as a sequential operation is quite misleading. And eventually you will actually break up, need to break up into uh, concurrent designs, concurrent understanding, and concurrent systems. This is what the course will give you. What programming languages are we going to use? The programming languages which are actually helping for the specific concept which you need to understand. So this is not necessarily your favorite programming language, but this will be other programming names, multiple of them as a matter of fact. Okay. Do, 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 do. Did I motivate you in any way to stay away from the ANU or to come to the ANU so far? Um, we have, we offer drop-in sessions uh, for the whole thing. The labs will be running a little different than previously. We do expect you this semester to actually have full preparation uh, before you come to the labs because your tutor time, your online time is highly valuable. 
And please don't waste it by um, going into your lab session and then start reading what you're supposed to do. Please do that beforehand and come prepared with some idea, ideas or problems or issues in your mind and we can directly work that. So uh, be very conscious and planning with your studies and we can uh, make the best use of the three hours which you have in those labs. Basically same with the lectures. Um, bombard us with questions and um, interaction and we will handle it accordingly. All right. Um, I would like to actually give you the word here a little bit. Um, any questions? What would hold you back coming here? I see nothing. That's good. Welcome, everybody. That means uh, we have 97 more students in computer science next semester. Um, computer science, by the way, is one of the a uh, few schools and few uh, parts of universities which is uh, doing fairly strong in terms of students. So you have a wide base of colleagues and friends to make. Uh, if you come to the ANU, this is not a, um, a small operation, but we can support you accordingly. Uh, so don't be afraid that you're drowning into in a 500 student class. We have experience in handling that uh, properly. Any other questions? Otherwise, I would hand back to Akil, who may have accumulated questions somewhere else. I don't actually. Wait. You don't? But I, right. I do so have. coming anyway. Good. Yeah, it looks like it, which is a good thing for us. Um, mm -hmm. There were a few questions from um, a separate forum away. So one was specifically from. Uh, partner uni students. So we have a number of our two plus two students in the audience today um, who wanted to know um, if them starting uh, remotely, and I guess this applies to the other students as well. So if they start remotely and then switch to um, the in-person classes when they can eventually travel here, um, they wanted to know what sort of support they'll have in terms of transitioning and whether things will be very different as opposed to the online. Uh, or remote delivery classes? Um, of course. Um, you can stay online for the whole semester, even if you move physically. Uh, but there are many courses are offering drop-in sessions, which will actually be physical as well. Um, the final exams are not completely decided at the moment. Um, the final exams could be partly physical or uh, partly online. And we will need to see how that goes. Support for transitioning, whatever we can do. Um, we interactively work with you guys to um, make this transition as smooth and easy as possible. Um, I can't tell you precisely what that means for you individually because we have to see what your specific case is. It depends very much when you're actually transitioning. Transitioning also means often that you have gaps um, that you are just packing up your stuff, you're traveling for a week, you're being online, offline someplace, you need to play, look for a house, you maybe need to look for a job. Um, so there are many personal circumstances which may hold you back there. So it depends very much at which phase of the semester. Um, I would strongly recommend, please ask us before you jump. So we have lots of support um, from individual conveners, uh, from me, from student services. Um, and just tell us, ask us, and we can give you advice when is a good time to do that. So for example, jumping uh, to the ANU just in the week before you do a final exams is probably not a wise move um, because you will put yourself under a lot of stress there. We see this, we see you definitely as people who actually have a life as well which means we will be looking at um, your overall situation, particularly this, this semester. Um, we have been keeping tabs um, on last semester's cohort as much as possible. Um, I'm myself are running all the course rep meetings for our school, which means I get all the feedback from all the courses and all the student feedback uh, across. And I have a very good understanding, believe it at least, um, where the issues are, where the pain points are. 
Um, what we heard a lot from last semester is, for example, that students are often have been feeling lonely at home. Um, they've been sitting in front of a screen and yes, uh, staring at friends uh, who are also staring at uh, cameras is entertaining for some time, but it's not quite replacing having a coffee chat uh, with your friends about the lab material, pitching a little bit about the lecturer and uh, getting a bit of um, personal direct interaction in the whole thing. It's not the same thing. We are aware of this and we are arranging for more of the uh, personal interaction there that you have uh, possibilities to do that. Does it answer that question somewhat? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Um, Josh and Leanne, do you have anything to add to that? Probably not. All right, perfect. Um, Josh, did you have one of the questions that you wanted to address um, before we wrap up the session? Because it looks like we have answered all the questions. Uh, look, I, I think I answered this in, in the text Q&A, but a lot of students seem to be a, a bit concerned that, that maybe um, if they're coming from a, a different background, like finance or math, um, and they don't have any computing background, that um, they might not be well prepared. Um, in general, our, our master's programs uh, don't make any assumption of having significant um, programming experience. And so that's one of the reasons why um, you would, might study a course like my, my course, Structured Programming, as your first, in your first semester. Um, however, if you do have significant programming experience, then there are ways to uh, achieve credit for that programming experience. So you're not forced to sit through you know, stuff that you already know. The best way to work this out is to talk to the program convener for your particular course, if it's Master of Computing or Master of computer vision or, or whatever you're studying, your program convener can look at your previous study history and help you decide what the best selection of courses are to enroll in. Often the question will not be so much, what uh, are you bringing in? Um, but what are you interested in? Um, if you are highly motivated to dive into five new programming languages, I say, come on, no problem at all. Right? If you say that, math is not my strong part and I kind of hate programming, I probably would not recommend you to come. Okay, So it's not so much of your relate to your background, but more how curious are you, how motivated you are, and then we take it from there. So trust us a little bit that we can help you, um, but you need to have the openness and the willingness to be helped. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I guess there's... Um, no more questions that I see in the Q&A box. And looks like we've finished um, five minutes ahead of time. So what I'm gonna do is, um, once again, thank you, Josh, Liang, Uwe, Yuching, and Vikram for your really valuable insights. Um, I personally found the session very, very interesting despite not being somebody who holds an offer or who's gonna enroll into a program. So. Uh, I'm sure the, the students found this session really useful as well. Um, just a reminder to those of you who um, are sitting with offers right now, uh, the 10th of July is the deadline for you to accept your offer to study with us in the July intake. Um, and for those of you who already, already accepted your offers, um, we look forward to welcoming you um, as a part of the ANU fraternity soon. Um, also, there's a number of different webinars running this week as a part of the ANU Webinar Week, of which um, the student life webinars are a really big focus. So these will cover some of the topics that we were talking about in terms of how students can you know, get to know their peers and get to know your classmates and things like that. So uh, I definitely recommend atten attending those sessions. Um, and if you have any other questions, please feel free to respond to the follow-up email that you get after this session. Um, those emails will come to me and if there are any specific questions, I'm happy to forward it and trouble our panelists today a little bit more. Um, with that, I guess we will conclude the session. Thanks again to all of you that attended and thank you to the panelists.